What's up everyone, I am the Kaiju no Kami, and today I'm going to be reviewing Bakuryu Sentai Abaranger from 2003. Hey, this was the first Sentai series to be airing when I got into Sentai. Or at least the first Sentais to premiere, because I believe Hurricaneer was just finishing up when I got into Sentai. But still, cool, isn't it? In 2003, Toei launched their follow-up to Hurricaneer, which was a new installment revolving around dinosaurs. This time around, instead of featuring dinosaur gods that survived extinction by mechanizing themselves, the asteroid that hit Earth 65 million years ago split the Earth apart into two dimensions. The first was deemed Dino Earth, which had the dinosaurs surviving the asteroid, evolving into intellectual creatures who assisted mankind rather than devoured them. The second Earth, which is known as another Earth by the inhabitants of Dino Earth, is meant to be the Earth we live on here in the real world, where dinosaurs were wiped out over time. I love multiverse stories, and one that revolves around dinosaurs becoming intellectual beings and then becoming mecha because of it is very intriguing. The question is, did Toei hatch all of the potential Abranger had to give, or is this just one idea that should have stayed extinct? Let's take a bite out of Abranger to find out. The Heroes. Abo Ranger is a bit strange. This is the only Sentai series to have solely four members from beginning to end. The first member of our team is Asuka, played by Kaoru Abe. Asuka grew up in a world at war after an evil empire invaded their world and turned it into a barren wasteland. There, he trained in the last standing city of Corinth where... Wait, wait. Wrong series. My bad. Let me try this again. Asuka grew up in a world that was ravaged by an evil empire and turned into a barren wasteland. There, he trained with the last survivors of his race, the Saurians, to battle the invaders in order to free their world from tyranny. Unfortunately for Asuka, the war cost him dearly as he lost his friends and family, which included his wife and her brother. At the start of the series, Asuka has to travel to another Earth in order to recruit a band of heroes who can help him battle the invaders as they have now set their sights on conquering another Earth. I really like Asuka due to all the backstory and development he receives throughout the show, though he can have moments of stupidity, as seen here. Another thing I do think was brilliant on the writer's part was he doesn't always partake in battle. At the start of the show, his henchin device is damaged, rendering him unable to transform for the first several episodes. In time, he does, but the amount of power his abilities require make him unable to participate in a couple of follow-up battles until they have recharged, as it were. This limits how often he can be used, which is something you don't often see from one of the main members of the team, as this was usually a trait relegated to the Sixth Rangers at the time. As such, it makes me ponder why Bandai did not consider Asuka to be the Sixth Ranger character of Abba Ranger. There is also one instance where he is stuck in the bathroom for half an episode due to some bad food he ingested. Next, we have Koichiro Nishi's Ryoga Hakua. Ryoga is a hot-headed red ranger who likes to jump into a situation without assessing it. Part of this stems from the fact that he is a single father. His brother and sister-in-law died sometime before the show's start. Of course! And as such, Ryoga had to take care of his niece Mai as if she were his own child. Therefore, he does whatever it takes to protect her and keep her happy while ensuring he acts as a positive influence towards her. It's another layer a Sentai series had never tackled before as usually any parental figures were reserved for the team's mentor rather than an actual ranger. It also allows Toei to keep a constant child character who can also act as the child victim of the week if need be instead of having the rangers instantly know every child in Japan. Granted, the latter does still happen, but only occasionally and not in every episode. Ryoga even manages to inadvertently stop someone from committing suicide due to his unmatched positivity. <laughs> 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 
てください落ちたらどうすんですあすいません<laughs> Additionally, Ryoga acquires a powered up form in the second half of the show known as Abare Max. Max Power, he's the man whose name you'd love to touch, but you mustn't touch. As Abare Max, he can send monsters into a dimensional realm in order to kick their asses without having to worry about anyone else getting hurt. Sanjo Yukito is the team's brooding cool guy, Chicks Dig. You don't want to get mixed up with a guy like me. I'm a loner, daddy. A rebel. Yukito is a world-renowned masseuse who has people of all backgrounds coming to him to fix their physical deficiencies, be it a race car driver who was in an accident, to an American baseball player. Yeah, Japan no matter what the ailment is, Yukito can fix it. Even if you're a dinosaur mech. Yukito comes from a rich family and despises his father, for the man paid the family of his girlfriend off because he deemed the woman unworthy of being with his son. This drove Yukito to step away from his family and make a name for himself. I will say that I do have mixed feelings on Sho Tomita's performance as Yukito. Tomita does a fine job portraying Yukito's serious side, however, when it comes to being silly, it feels forced. He just doesn't have the range necessary to play both a cool loner and emotional comedian at the same time, which is why Yakito is my least favorite of the quartet. <laughs> Finally, there's Aiko Ito's Ranu Itsuki. Ranru was nearly an idol before giving up that position in order to become an engineer. Thus, she is the team's technical genius, always coming up with new devices in order to stop the latest villainous scheme. Sometimes it feels like her devices are plot convenient, while at other times they do feel like something she could have come up with. <laughs> Either way, that's about the extent of her character. She's smart, she makes things, and she's good at it. I do like how picky she can be with food as I totally relate to her in that manner. I would totally love to see her be confronted by Goki from Gingaman for her pickiness in food. Still, there is nothing wrong with being a picky eater. Sometimes you just don't want to eat something that looks like crap. In addition to our four heroes and Mai, the other rangers are assisted by a dinosaur-themed curry shop owner named Ryunosuke Sugashita and high school student Emery Imanaka. In the first episode during the dinosaurs' rampage of Japan, both Ryunosuke and Emery are lured to Asuka by hearing the voices of the dinosaurs leading him to them. They attempt to transform without success. <laughs> Regardless, Ryanosuke invites the rangers to live at his curry shop while they battle the alien invaders, which also helps him feel alive. Koen Okumara, who has appeared in several Kamen Rider series, plays this dinosaur lover. Hmm? <laughs> there is one thing I'm a tad confused by regarding Ryanosuke, and that is in regard to his age. In one episode, a childhood friend of his says that after they came back from the war, they helped with rebuilding Japan. In another episode, we see a teenage Ryunosuke cheering his siblings up while amidst the wreckage from the atomic bombs in Japan. So, was he a soldier in World War II? Or wasn't he? As I said, it's very perplexing. As for Emery, who is played by Michi Nishijima, she hangs out with the team to provide moral support. Well, that, and she dreams of one day becoming Abare Pink, something she does achieve at one point when her parents were moving to Thailand and she didn't want to go. Kind of. 
激で激震。暴れピンク。暴れピンク？マジル戦隊。アマベンダー。Anyway, the suits the teams don to fight the villains are known as the Attack Bandit Resistance Suits, or ABR. Abare, if you go by Japanese syllables. Which is where Ryoka and Emery derive their team name as being Abare Ranger. Attack Bandit Resistance. Yoppa, Abare Jan. Bakuryu Sentai Abare Ranger de Daisekai. Ano. Kimari. Ja, kare tabe wa. Each member can also utilize an inner strength deemed Dino Guts to power up their suits into what is called rampaging mode. Aside from this, they also have typical weapons such as a gun that can also become a sword, and then some individual weapons which can merge together to form a cannon to dish out the final attack. One cool aspect is that Asuka's weapon can be combined with the Dino Bomber to increase its firepower. Super Dino Bomber! Shisat! Super Dino Dynamite! Unfortunately, while the Rangers have a set of Velociraptors that can ride on like a horse, they are hardly ever used. The battle continues in a new place in time with Dino Riders. There are a couple of notable guest stars Toku fans may recognize, such as Battle Royale and Common Rider Blades Taru Suwa, who plays Dino Curry's most loyal customer Yokota. The actress who played photographer Hanami in Time Ranger makes an appearance as a news reporter, also named Hanami. No relation. Hi, Genba no Hanami des. Finally, there is also Mega Ranger Samuel Papaning playing baseball star Bucky Bonds. Power Ranger fans might recognize him from one of the most notable episodes of Dino Thunder, where they had the Rangers watching an episode of Abba Ranger, which included an extremely cringe-inducing English dub. My name is Kaching, a monster who feeds on greed. With my magic wings, I will soon control the world. Pink hair, quite a scare. Huh? I heard the world's best chiropractor lives here. You're right, he does. You're not here to play baseball. How can I play baseball when I can hardly move? I have to find this chiropractor. His name is Kenny Yakito. Oh. Hey, you saved me. Now I can play baseball again, and I'm going to tell everyone what a great chiropractor you are. Imagine the incredible career you can have. You could be rich. The villains. Our villains are a group of plants. Parasites, something known as Evolians. They are ruled by an evil god known simply as Dismo Paramecia, who likes to talk the talk but can't walk the walk. He's pretty much non-existent in the last four episodes of the show, and even then, he's quite lackluster. Hell, he doesn't even utter a word during the final battle. I won't say he is the franchise's worst villain leader, as he isn't. Still, he is pretty damn close when it comes to uselessness. His biggest claim to fame is possessing the body of child villain Rije to give orders. <laughs> That's all that he really does. His four generals are known as apostles. We have the apostle of creation, Mikela. The Apostle of Infinity, Volfa. The Apostle of Destruction, Janu. Now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night. 
and the aforementioned Rije makes up the Apostle of Dawn. Overall, they're not exactly stellar enemies, though the arc revolving around Janu, Rije, and Asuka are what makes the villains memorable, despite clearly ripping off Jetman. Janu inhabits the body of Asuka's dead wife, Mahoro, and as such, Asuka sets his main quest to kill Janu in order to allow Mahoro to rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, we will have a couple well choreographed battles between the duo, providing some of the best fights of the show. It's also nice to have a rivalry between a hero and a villain after a couple of years of being absent. At the start of the show, Janu's brother leads the invasion of Earth wearing an ancient armor that turns its wear into a mass murdering psychopath. Upon his defeat, Janu kills him and takes the armor for herself, which is often what she will wear in fierce combat. <laughs> Furthermore, we come to learn that Rije is actually Mahoro's child who was birthed by Desmo Paramesi in order to give himself a host body. Rije's sole purpose beyond this aspect is to send monsters to Earth. <laughs> Even when she becomes an adult in the second half of the show, renaming herself Rije, <laughs> She doesn't do too much in the way beyond participating in a couple of fights. She does have a crush on the evil opera ranger known as Opera Killer, whom I will get into shortly, which also leads to a cat fight between her and Janu. As for Mikula and Volfa, aside from one episode when they go to Earth and end up making friends with a bunch of high school girls, the only reason they exist is to make the monsters of the week. No wonder they're always getting high. Mikula's monsters are known as trinoids, as they are made from the combining of an animal, a flower, and an object. <laughs> I will say that they are not even close to being anywhere near my favorite monsters of the week. There is an occasional cool one, such as the Egyptian-esque Voli Cheshire. <laughs> and we have this Trinoid, who is able to copy the weapons of his opponents, which leads to a pretty funny scene where the Abarangers think they can outsmart him. <laughs> You got what you deserved. One thing I do have to give the show credit for is how they execute the trinoids. Each trinoid has a number. However, the first trinoid we actually meet is trinoid number four. It isn't until later on the show that we come to find out Mikula sent out his first three trinoids at the time of their invasion, and we meet them over time. <laughs> It's a pretty cool concept with the first trinoid actually being the last trinoid the Abba Rangers encounter, who easily has the best design of them all. <laughs> In fact, that may be the biggest issue I have with the Trinoids. They just don't have great designs. Another problem is many of them are just way too goofy, such as Telefatsadile, who becomes the show's comic relief staple after he is taken prisoner by Abare Killer. <laughs> Anyhow, upon being blown up, a piece of fruit that was lodged into their bodies during their creation creates a rainstorm that grows them big. No, 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 
Volfa makes giant monsters called Giganoids. There's not too much to really say about them except that I do like their random ass names, which includes Fate, <laughs> The Hunt, <laughs> From the New World, And tragic. No idea how he came up with those names, but sure, why not? The grunts are known as Abioma Troopers. They're white or black dudes with swirly things on them. That's all I've got, really. The last and most important villain of the series is Dr. Mikoto Nakadai. <laughs> Makoto was a surgeon who was bored with life, even walking out of an operation because of it. He was also the one who saved Ryoga on the night of the dinosaur attack, a task he comes to regret doing after witnessing Ryoga becoming Abared. He ends up acquiring a prototype henshin bracelet that Asuka believes will explode after continual use, taking out an entire city in its radius, which excites Mikoto to no end. Makoto is hands down the best character in the show and the one that ultimately saves it from being forgettable. Though, even he suffers from writing issues. There are times when he will appear just for the sake of appearing as if the writers were afraid to not have him show up for an episode and do nothing in that appearance. Also, his whole let's play a game type attitude can get a tad, well, boring at times. Thankfully, Kotaro Tanaka displays a lot of charisma and charm to Makoto to elevate him above everyone else. What I also love is that Makoto never truly joins a side. While he may more often than not battle the Abarangers, he will also attack the Evolians if it is in his best interest. He also appears to have an infatuation with Janu for her ruthlessness, while Rije gains his attention by telling him that she will soon grow into an adult with a nice body. <laughs> <laughs> Makoto is a huge sociopath who does whatever he can to show the Abarangers the low points of humanity and is even willing to sacrifice himself if it means everyone on Earth dies with him. This really drives Ryoka nuts to the brink of insanity. <laughs> For as lackluster as things might be with the vast majority of players in this show, Makoto does keep things interesting by breaking the conventional tropes one comes to expect from a Sentai show. Thank you, my The Mecha. The Mecha are a bunch of sentient dinosaurs who are the sole survivors of their race after the Evolian invasion of Dino Earth. The initial trio we meet includes a T-Rex, a Triceratops, and Pteranodon. They first show up rampaging through Japan under the control of the Evolians. Until Ryoga, Ranru, and Yukito manage to take control of them upon transforming. From there, their freedoms are returned and over time we learn that Tirano lost his wife and daughter in battle, Kira lost his parents, and Tira lost her husband. Wow. I never knew a Sentai show could make you feel sad for its mecha. Congratulations, Toei. If you were trying to make Abaranger the saddest toku show in history, you have succeeded. Our starting trio combine together to form Abareno, I do have to say I love the name Ryoga gives their max during one episode when only Tirano and Kira are around to combine. Abareno. 
行くぞ暴れようぜおい That is absolutely hilarious. Asuka's partner, Brachio, access the home for all the other dinosaurs as he is the show's carrier Mac, who will often spout some random nonsense revolving around the episode's plot. <laughs> like with all the other shows of the 2000s, there are a bunch of auxiliary mechs, though, unlike Gal Ranger, among others, they keep the number to a minimum with there only being five additional dinos to combine with Aberano. This includes a Pachycephalosaurus, an Ankylosaurus, a Dimetrodon, a Stegosaurus, and a Spanish speaking Pterosaurolophus. <laughs> In addition to them, the Alba Rangers do acquire another dinosaur through Alba Ray Max's power named Storaco, who forms Max Oja. Of course, Max Oja can also lazily combine with the auxiliary dinos, creating Max Ryuo. Aubrey Killer also has his own dinosaur companion, another Pteranodon named Top Geller. Some of you may recognize Top Geller's voice, as voice actor Hikaru Midorikawa portrays him. <laughs> in his initial appearance, Top Geller hijacks Stego and the duo merge together to create Killer O. <laughs> From this point forward, Stego acquires a sense of Stockholm Syndrome and willingly joins up with Makoto and Top Geller. The effects and music! For as innovative as Upper Ranger is in its narrative, Toei went way overboard on the use of CGI, so much so that it renders Upper Ranger into possibly being the poorest looking series of all time. There is not a single scene of the dinosaurs individually that is not done in CGI, and it seems like there are only a couple of different scenes animated for them. Most of the time, we see the same scene used repeatedly throughout the entire show. The only time we don't see the dinosaurs in CGI is when we see their heads, or a part of their body that is used to attack, such as a tail or fist. And that's about it. It's very extreme. Even a lot of the mech battles are stymied in excessive amounts of CGI. There are times where it looks like a PlayStation 2 game came to life in the real world, pulling you out of the immersion. As such, it really takes its toll on the viewer's suspension of disbelief, and this is coming from someone who tends to overlook bad CGI as long as there is a good story to go with it. Here, however, I can't ignore it. Especially when shows before it were able to do better with practical effects. They even went overboard on the CGI sparks during fight scenes, which also took away from my enjoyment of it more so than in any other series. <laughs> The problem is that Toei got way too ambitious in what the technology of the time would allow them to do, therefore, Abba Ranger suffers immensely for it. Thank the gods the show has a pretty kick-ass soundtrack to make up for it. Kenshiro Hanada's score is just absolutely incredible all around. <laughs> It pumps your blood up and rocks your socks off. I love how he took Rijay's theme and then distorted it for Rijel. Not to mention Hideaki Takatori's fight, for the Earth is one of Sentai's finest insert songs of the entire franchise. <laughs> And then of course, we have the opening theme, sung by Masaki Endo, which really hypes you up for the next half hour. <laughs> that 
So, that doesn't mean Akira Kishida's We Are The One, Bokuro Wa Hitotsu, is any slouch either. As this is one extremely energetic ending theme. Again, one of Sentai's finest. The episodes. Abba Ranger is a weird show compared to others in its structure. Until Hurricaneger, Sentai Shows had an opening song, the first half of the episode, the second half, and then the closing song with naturally the previews for the next episode. In the middle of Hurricaneger's run, they added a prologue before the opening, which was fine, though I feel you engage the audience more by having the opening first. Regardless, Abba Ranger completely breaks the structure entirely by having a prologue, the opening song, part of the episode, the second half, the ending theme, and then an epilogue sequence to the episode before getting to the previews for the next one. Adding to the oddity is the fact that the epilogue sequences can be anywhere from a minute in length to nearly four minutes long, which means the second half of the episode can be shorter than normal. I'm not sure why Naruhisa Arakawa chose to write the show in this manner, he just did. Moving on, Abba Ranger is a show I feel has a lot of great ideas bogged down by poor execution. Even ignoring the distracting CGI, Abba Ranger is a mixed bag all over the place as there is never an exact chunk of poor episodes, it's spread across its entirety. Sometimes we will have like two good episodes, followed up by two poor ones, which are then succeeded by another top-notch episode, only for the subsequent one to be subpar. It's all over the place in quality. One moment I thought was brilliant was when a Giganoid sent the Rangers back in time, only for Rijay and Gang to find themselves being wiped out of reality due to the Abba Rangers preparing for their invasion hundreds of years earlier. <laughs> Naturally, they realize the error of their ways and have the rangers brought back to the present. The show never gets to mind-blowing levels of bad outside of two instances, one being the annual clip show that pretty much repeats the plot of rangers stuck in a dream world where they are everyday people dreaming they are superheroes. Think the Shikinger Returns movie, even though that came out later. The other horrendous episode is titled The Fishing Fool's Rampaging Diary. It's a pleasure! In this one, a trinoid kidnaps people with a fishing rod and ends up kidnapping an anime child in the process. Let me repeat that. A trinoid is kidnapping people and somehow, in some way, kidnaps a child from a fishing anime. That's probably all I need to say about this episode, but then this happens. Musko! What? Not only is this the worst episode to Abba Ranger, but it may be the worst episode in the history of the franchise. It is so friggin' stupid! I guess the only positive I can say is at least the Roger Rabbit styled animation to live action fusion is exceptional? I guess. As for my favorite episode, that honor goes to the exquisite Rampaging Queen. This is the episode where Rijay becomes Rijal, and it is just a blast. First, we have mass performers that are using autotune instruments to suck the color out of the environment. They must have gone to the same film school as Zack Snyder. Not to mention these guys seriously make me think of the culture poles from Die Ranger. <laughs> then we have Rijo kicking all kinds of Abba Ranger ass to the sweet sounds of musical bliss. <laughs> It's just a fun episode all around, and one of the ones I have rewatched many times over in the 17 years since Abba Ranger aired. <laughs> the movies! You pretty much know what to expect here. Abba Ranger has a summer theatrical movie and a versus one. 
taking place between episodes 21 and 22, this movie, called Opera Ranger Deluxe, features a hexanoid who shoots out a beam that clothes anyone hit with it into a woman's two-piece swimsuit, whether they are a man or a woman. <laughs> It's odd yet. It works. A princess of Saurian legend appears to the rangers asking for help to fix a sword that would allow her to stop two evil dinosaurs from freezing the world. It's not perfect, but it is easily one of the most entertaining summer movies and also introduces a combined form between Abareno, their dino buddies, and Killer O. Oh, and how can you not think of this when seeing the ending theme? It's also worth noting that it is important to watch due to these dino white walkers appearing in the final arc of the show itself. He's been disarmed. Finally, there's Aberranger vs. Hurricanger. This one starts off with a mech battle between both series' respective mechs, as a not dead Wendanu and Fura Bijou have taken control of them in order to free an Evo Dino Earth Space Ninja. <laughs> The Aberrangers naturally have to team up with the Hurricanes to battle him. Jakito decides to use one of Mortal Kombat's X rays attacks on a monster. Sanjo Crush. Alberano gains an ability thanks to the Hurricanes. And Obero breaks the fourth wall to comment on such. Overall, it's not my favorite versus film, and it breaks its own continuity within the first five minutes, making it so it cannot be canonical at all with the show. But, like the summer movie, it is a pretty solid one overall. It doesn't get boring, and it doesn't have the two teams fighting each other because reasons. At the end of the day, there is so much I love about Abba Ranger that it pains me to have to do this, but... I have no choice other than to give Abba Ranger a 3 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. The excessive amount of CGI really hinders this show, as do some of the Monsters of the Week that can get a little too over the top in silliness. Still, this is a show that every Sentai fan should check out, even if it's just once, as it is well worth a watch. I just wish it had fully lived up to its potential. Until next time, bye. Oh, yeah, my